you've been uh, studying through a doctrine, um, try to do that once a winter and go through a different one. And this time we're doing the doctrines about Christ, uh, Jesus, our Lord and Savior. And the good question is, who was Jesus? That was an important question. Jesus actually asked his disciples that in Matthew chapter 16. Got a variety of uh, responses. He asked them basically, who, you know, who do people say I am? So he's taking a real survey and uh, got a, a variety of answers. And um, Jesus, uh, Peter was the one who gave the correct answer, uh, the one that identified Jesus as God himself. That's an important question that everybody needs to answer for themselves. Eternity is in the balance based on what you answer on that particular question. If Jesus is not God, then there's no Christianity at all. Doesn't exist, not that important. Uh, and if that's the truth, if, if Jesus is not God, then you know what that makes you and I? We're idolaters because we're worshiping a false God, if that's the case. If he is not God, then he's not even good. You know, some people have said that, oh, he's a good man, a prophet, things like that, but that would not be true because he clearly claimed to be God and um, he'd be a blasphemer in that case. I have a quote that I want to show you from uh, J. Oswald Sanders and Mark had just flushed over me that I didn't bring my presenter. I'm sorry. Thank you. Good thing Mark's here all the time. The deity of Christ is the key doctrine taught in Scripture. If you reject it, then the Bible becomes confused jumble of words. I like that phrase because I've had a lot of people over the years say to me, I try reading the Bible, but it doesn't make sense. Well, no, it doesn't make sense. You know, it's a, it's a heart issue. However, if you accept it, the Bible is an intelligible and ordered revelation of God. The Bible just, like to me, is the most logical, clearest thing ever I've read. But part of that is not because of me. I'm not any more intelligent. I am that guy. I am the guy that if you get in the same line at the grocery store I get into, it's backed up, uh, guaranteed. You know, you can switch lines, it'll be okay. I switch lines, it's a disaster. I was at the... Um, the other day at the airport, and I, I don't like this about airports, you have to go through security. And so I had a, a little carry-on uh, suitcase, and then you have to do your coat and your shoes, and then you have to take uh, my carry-on reading bag and your wallet and your cell phone and all that. So I had two bins and the suitcase thing. And I was zipping through, this was in LA, and I'm zipping through, and there's like billions of people behind me. and. And I know they're all saying, come on, guy, get moving. And so I grabbed everything, and when you get through and you're okay, I stacked my stuff, moved it to the end, got out of everybody's way, and started getting dressed. And then realized, somebody took my shoe. I am missing a shoe. And um, so I go to the security person and tell them, and then I go back to the line and somewhere along the line, and I do think it was the security guy, I would never do anything like this, but um, the security guy, I think, knocked it out of my bin when he was moving my thing, and it was all the way down the end of the line somewhere. So I had to go down with one shoe on, one shoe off, carrying everything else, and get down there, and there were two 20, 30-year-old women who see me <laughs> go after my shoe. They're laughing hysterically. I'm good for a laugh, okay? So, um, I used to always, I, here's the thing that's good about this. I'm old, and you can get away with it. 20 years ago, I was just dumb. Now I'm old. I like that so much better. So I left my presenter in the office. You accept this, and it becomes real, and it becomes intelligible to you. It makes sense. Um, Jesus is God. We've already discussed the fact a couple of weeks ago that he is eternal God, and that's enough to say, and that is the same as saying that he is deity. He is God. And so, you know, take all those thoughts and notes and put them in your uh, gray matter. 
We, we noticed a while back uh, in the month of December, the incarnation, God became man, Emmanuel, God with us. Christ came to flesh and dwelt with man, and he became a man. Next Sunday, we're going to talk about the humanity side of Jesus, the Christ, the Messiah. And we examined um, a little bit last time about his growing years and, and some of the events that took place while he was growing. The absolute basis of Christianity is that God, the second person of the Trinity, Jesus, the Christ, became human. That is the basis of everything that we believe and everything we think. Um, I have some definitions. Deity is absolute equality with the Father. There is no difference between Jesus, the Son, and God, the Father, as far as ranking in the Godhead. It's not like number one, number two, and oh, by the way, Holy Spirit, you're number three. Um, and it's not anything like that. There is a oneness and an equality there. Jesus is every bit God. Jesus is also the, um, the expression of God. He is the revealer of God. John 1, 18 says, you know, that no man has seen God, but Jesus the Son makes him known to us. When in the Old Testament, we talked about that a couple weeks ago, that um, when we saw situations, Abraham and Moses having um, direct contact with God, that those were Christ, those were Jesus in his pre-existence um, meeting with those individuals. He is the expression of God, and then all the qualities that belong to God are true in Jesus. There's nothing that God the Father is that Jesus is not. <laughs> that doesn't happen. They are the same. They are one in essence, one in purpose, one in every sense, uh, and there's nothing lacking or nothing different. There's a lot of um, creedal testimonies that uh, have come. I mentioned, I referred earlier to Matthew 16 and that survey that, that Jesus took, and, and it was Peter who said, you are the son of the living God. That, that was a great testimony of Peter to say that, and Jesus said, that is right on. That is the foundation that testimony, that belief, that fact, and that truth is the foundation of, of everything Christian. Over the years, um, believers have come together and, and formed statements. And uh, the, in the year 165, the Apostles' Creed was written. And I think it was just Christians coming together say, we need to write down what we believe. Here's what they said about Jesus. I believe in God the Father, Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his son, our Lord. That's what early Christians said. That's what we believe about him. That Jesus is the son. He is the Lord God. He is um, God. A, a couple hundred years later came the uh, Nicene Creed. And that came about because there were some heresies starting to come up. Some people saying that uh, there was a difference between Jesus the human and Christ the God, and, and I mean, it gets really technical, but they didn't believe that Jesus was the second person. And during the Nicene Creed, it says, I believe in our Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, being of one substance with the Father. They were trying to affirm again that no, what we understand Scripture to teach and what God has revealed is that Jesus is one with the Father. It goes a long time. There's lots of others in between. But then uh, when you come to the Westminster Confession in, in the year 1675, right around there. Um, and, and remember, we're coming out of the Reformation. And particularly in England, they're having real struggles over uh, the Church of England and who they're, who they're siding with. And the Westminster Confession comes up with this statement. The Son of God, the second person in the Trinity, being very and eternal God, of one substance and equal with the Father, did, when the fullness of time was come, take upon him man's nature. Being of one substance with the Father. The Son 
is God. He is deity. That's what had been taught throughout the ages. That's what we like to believe as well. Here's a guy, you may have heard of him. His name was Napoleon. He was a general. And uh, it's kind of interesting when you read, I just read to you testimonies of groups of Christians that came together and, and said what they believe about Christ. Napoleon is somebody who made an interesting observation about Jesus, and he was not a Christian. Okay, now I, I found lots of quotes of people like that, but I thought Napoleon would be one that you would enjoy. I read a story once about Napoleon that I don't know if this is true or not, but this is a story that was written about him. It may have happened, it may not. But on one occasion, reportedly, he was challenged by another general that they had from another country that they had sort of aligned with. And 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 the guy was asking him, you know, about his style of leadership and all that. And supposedly, reportedly, um, Napoleon wanted to impress upon him how much he had control over his men. So he turned to his army, got him in formation, and he ordered march. And they started marching. And they came to a cliff. And they continued to march. And one by one, their soldiers supposedly fell over the cliff and to their death. And Napoleon turned and said, that's my leadership. You know, that's what I'm like. All that to say whether that's true or not, Napoleon was a great military leader who was able to, um, to command men. Listen to what Napoleon said. I know men. And I tell you, Jesus was not a man. Superficial minds see a resemblance between Christ and the founders of empires and the gods of other religions. This resemblance does not exist. Jesus Christ alone founded his empire on love. And at this hour, millions would die for him. In every other existence but that of Christ, how many imperfections. He's saying this is a unique man, someone totally different. We suggest Jesus Christ is 100% God. This last week was kind of interesting. Um, the one day USA Today on Wednesday had um, an interesting article on the second page. You know how uh, USA Today is a big newspaper. And on the second page, it had this big article about the Mormon church and about how some people who really enjoy being Mormon because they're different and all that kind of stuff. Well, it had in there also uh, a very unique thing. It had uh, listed about what they believed, what they believed about um, who God is, what they believed about the Trinity, what they believed about Scripture, what they believed about salvation. And it compared the Mormons to the Catholic Church, to Southern Baptists, to the United Methodists, and to the Assemblies of God, which is a charismatic group. And so, very, very interesting comparisons. I'm not gonna read to you any of that, actually. But I do find it fascinating because I think the whole thing of Christianity centers around who do you say Jesus is? Well, the Christian science says Jesus Christ is not God, as Jesus himself declared, but the Son of God. See, they, they talk about emanations, that you have God the Father, and then down below that, you can have God the Son. They would say, ultimately, that we can climb that ladder up also and be on the same level as Jesus, but we'd never be on the level of God the Father. Jehovah Witnesses say that Jesus was not the Son of God, and the Mormons separate gods uh, as to their purpose. The Father has one purpose. He's totally different. The Son has another. He's totally different. And uh, they would say that salvation can come here in this life or in the afterlife. And salvation is somehow connected to baptism with them. And you, if you're a good Mormon, you can be baptized on behalf of non-Mormons. You can be baptized on behalf of non-Mormons who are dead. And you can help them get salvation through th things like that. To them, they would say man's eternal destiny is to become God. That's what you are supposed to do. 
Jesus is not simply like God or some lesser form of God. He is God. Colossians 2.9 says, For in Christ all the fullness of the deity or Godhead lives in bodily form. Well, what does the Grace Brethren say? I put the statement on for you. Uh, this is a statement of our doctrinal uh, belief. The Lord Jesus Christ, his preexistence and his deity is found in John chapter 1. Remember John 1 where it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then it goes on to talk about as creator and stuff. And we always jump down to verse 14 and say, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among men. We know that to be Jesus. And, and then in verse 18, how it tells, he reveals God the Father. Uh, we think about the Lord Jesus Christ in, uh, and his incarnation by virgin birth or virgin conception, that he had come to earth, that he was born, and that it was Emmanuel, God with man, that came in. We, we like to think about his sinless life. He, Hebrews chapter 4, particularly verses 14 to 16, talk about him as a high priest, and how he is touched by what we experience. But in verse 15, it reminds us that he had been tempted, very much like all of us have been tempted, yet he was tempted without ever yielding to sin. He had never sinned. He lived a, sin, a sinless life. 2 Corinthians 5, um, verse 21, talks about how he is the substitutionary payment for our sin. Uh, he had a substitutionary death on our behalf. And it, what happened there was God made him sin. He who never knew sin, he who never did sin, he who had nothing to do with sin whatsoever, God poured all of the sin of the world upon him, and he paid for that price. He had an eternal, it was eternal God separated from eternal God, for those hours while he was on the cross and he did that to pay for our eternal life we believe in his bodily resurrection uh, that when he was uh, crucified and laid in the tomb that on the third day sunday morning he literally walked out of that tomb in a bodily form some people would say well no that was sort of a spiritual resurrection or or something else um, but we believe that it was a true bodily resurrection. And we believe that, um, you know, 40 days later, he ascended into heaven and, and is right now involved in a present ministry of being a high priest for you and I. Uh, in Hebrews, it talks about how he sits on the right hand of the Father. He's, he ever prays to make intercession for you and I. In Romans 8, it talks about how you and I don't know how to pray, but the Holy Spirit I like to use the word, translates those prayers for us. So you're struggling and, and you don't know what's going on and, and you don't even know what the right answer is or how to pray, what way do we want to go in this? Um, you can pray your heart, but the Holy Spirit, knowing your heart, will, will interpret that. And Jesus intercedes for you. He's on your side. In 1 John chapter 2, it talks about Jesus is our advocate literally he's our defense lawyer so when satan stands before god and says look at bud what an idiot he is look how stupid he is and look how sinful he is look at the tainted heart he has look at all the selfishness and and things of bud and and god would have to say you know you're right you're absolutely right that's true all of that is true and jesus will step up and say yes but he's mine and i died for him and those sins have been paid for. And then God will say, he's accepted. He's approved. And he does the same thing for you. Jesus is our defense lawyer, our advocate. And he has a present ministry. And he's coming again. He's coming again. Sometimes it feels like it, it may, may be way too far off. But the scriptures tell us that Christ is going to return. And we don't know when it is. I don't think it's going to be December 21st this year. I don't know. The Mayan calendar, I think, is slightly flawed. But, um, and, and by the way, they, that calendar, people are saying it's the end of the world. The end of the world is at least 1,007 years away, okay? It's not going to happen on December 21st. The rapture may happen 
on December 20th or December 22nd or January 30th or 29th. We don't know. We don't know when that's going to happen. But there's a lot of things there that um, Christ is going to come again. Christ has the attributes that, that God the Father also has and God the Holy Spirit. For instance, he's omniscient. That means he's all-knowing. And I've listed verses in there for you. I love the John 2 thing. He is really reading thoughts of these guys and, and using it and, and bringing it back to them. We can go over that another time. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 where, where it says, Paul wrote that God made Christ the wisdom of God. That's what he is on earth. When he was here, he was the wisdom of God. Jesus is omnipotent, all-powerful uh, man. In Matthew chapter 9, he, he heals a paralytic. And they were all saying, you have no right to say to him that his sins are forgiven. Oh, really? Okay, stand up and walk. And he does that. He comes to see and commands the water. And in Luke chapter 8, they're like, "Who? Peter, is? who is this man? that even the elements of the world submit to him and, and listen to him and obey him. Jesus is omnipresent. In Matthew chapter 28, uh, it sa he says in verse 20 that, Lo, I am with you always, even unto the ends of the world. So you can go to Wadsworth after service is over. You can go to Oroville. You can go to Sterling. You can go to India. It doesn't matter where you go. Christ is going to be present with you. I like to say the, the idea of his omni, uh, omnipresence is that he is everywhere sensed at all times. He's always with you at all times. By the way, on the omnipotent one, I typoed uh, when I put Matthew 28. It's not Matthew 28, 28. You know there's no Matthew 28, 28. It's Matthew 28, 18. And uh, why they put the one next to the two on a typewriter, I'll never know. But um, Jesus is omnipresent. Uh, in John 14, he told them that he will not leave them. And he will not leave them as orphans. He will always be with them. Christ has the nature of deity. All the qualities that belong to God. He's infinite. He's eternal. He's self-existing. He's immutable. That means he doesn't change. He was absolutely holy. In Luke chapter 1, it says that uh, this, the King James says, this holy thing that is inside of you, that's Christ. He was holy at his conception. He continues to be holy. Hebrews 4, we told you he was without sin, uh, tempted yet without sin. No one accepted the challenge that he gave in John chapter 8. He said this, can any of you prove me guilty of sin? Can any of you prove me guilty of sin? That's a great question. Now, this is an audience that is anti-Jesus. The religious leaders who are trying to get him out of their world because he's stealing their claim to fame. And in verse 48, their answer is this. The Jews answered him, aren't we right in saying that you're a Samaritan? Um, no, you're not. And that you're demon-possessed? No, you're not. <laughs> That's their answer. Jesus said, go ahead, show to me what sin I've committed. <laughs> now, that's not hard to do. We probably each, if you know anybody in this room, you could help them remember a time when they failed and sinned. All of us have done that. And he said to his critics, go ahead, prove to me that I have sinned. And they come up with two things that are just bogus and not true. And, and, um, and Christ goes on to remind them that they're inaccurate. He had a genuine love. He really, not only was he holy, but he was loving toward us. John 10 especially speaks of that, how no one can, and we just sang it too, that we can't be plucked out of his hands at all. Christ has the names of deity. Uh, he was called God. He was called the Son of God. He was called Lord. I, I read somewhere there's like 13 different versions of things like Almighty God and stuff that he's been called. Christ is the work of God. He's a creator. He's a judge. Christ is worshipped as deity, and he accepted it. That's kind of interesting because when people did worship him, he didn't say, whoa, whoa, back off. I'm not God. People do that. 
when Paul was treated that way, um, he said, you know, I'm a man of like passions of you. Don't worship me as God. John had the same experiences, and angels have done that. People have tried to worship angels, and they say, don't worship us. We're just a messenger. You worship the one true God. Jesus received worship without any conflict to that. God the Father gave testimony that Jesus was his son. At his baptism, at the transfiguration, uh, he said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Christ claimed equality with God. In John chapter 10, verse 30, Jesus said, I and my Father are one. That's, there's no denying that. In John chapter 14, verse 9, he said, He that has seen the Father has seen me. And so Jesus claims equality with God. Uh, he says in John 5, 17, My Father is always at work to this very day, and I too am working. He's my Father, and we do this together. And I think it's significant when he said that about my Father's working and I'm working they understood, the Jewish mind understood that if you referred to God as your father, no one did prior to that. You're claiming a special relationship. They also had a thing where if you mentioned yourself in the same sentence as the name of God, that was blasphemy. That was disrespectful. You should never do anything like that. That's why right after he said, my father's working and I'm working as well, the next verse, it says, for this reason... The Jews tried all the harder to kill him. Not only was he breaking his Sabbath, he was doing good stuff on the Sabbath. How, how evil. Who would have ever thought of doing something good on God's day? But he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal to God. The Jews understood what he was doing. He was making himself equal to God. He was saying, I am God. I am deity. And the Jews decided they were going to stone him for that. Now, those cults that I mentioned earlier, Christian Science, Jehovah's Witness, Mormons, many of them are going to say, Jesus never said he was God. In fact, the, uh, the Christian Science and Jehovah's Witness clearly say that, that they said Jesus never claimed to be God. He said he was the Son of God. Oh, really? If he didn't claim to be God, then why are the Jews killing him because he claimed to be God? <laughs> That's the only reason. They never found sin. They couldn't meet that challenge. They couldn't find anything. He said he was God. They didn't agree, so they killed him. <clears throat> Sanders states that there are no fewer than 16 names clearly implying the deity uh, of Jesus Christ, and that he is Lord. So the question again, who was Jesus? Is he God or is he not? If not, then we're blasphemers. This is silly. Everything we're doing doesn't make sense. Let's check out. Uh, there's got to be something better on TV or somewhere else. If he is God, then we need to worship him with all of our hearts. We need to serve him with everything that we are. Let's pray together. Father, thank you so much for the truth of your word that reveals you to us. And you have revealed yourself through Jesus Christ, the one and true God. Thank you for his life. Thank you for coming to this earth and being God with us. We would not know God if it weren't for Jesus, who is God. Thank you for a sinless life so that he could be a sinless sacrifice, pure and holy. Thank you for the death on the cross, the payment for our sins. Thank you for the victory of the tomb, the empty tomb that proved to us that Jesus Christ is God over all of this world, over all of life, over all of sin, over all of death. Thank you for the gift of eternal life that we can have in him. Lord, I pray for each one here that they would know Christ as Savior or that they will today bow their hearts before him and acknowledge him as Lord and God. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen.